guess two of us can't stand here at the same time as we are. Um, well, welcome. I um, wanted to actually, since we have some new people here tonight, I'm going to pass around our uh, sign-up form just that tells us how you heard about us and um, <coughs> just some information. If you'd like to sign up for our newsletter, we'll send you one. So anyone that's not signed in before, uh, please do. I know this front row has because I recognize all of you. Guys. Do you want to start that way? <coughs> that would be fantastic. Thank you. Well, um, we were here last week. We've, uh, uh, as you know, expanded, and we have our, from our history lecture series last week. We had Lawrence tell us about the Battle of the Atlantic, which was fabulous. And um, this week we have um, one of our a few there's a hole in the floor. Sorry, um, our industry lecture series are completely aimed at a different demographic. We have some overflow, and we've got new people, so this is very exciting. Um, next next lecture, I'm going to tell you about that before I tell you about uh, tonight's event. Um, but next month, we have on June 14th, we're going to talk about, we're going to have a virtual tour of Armin Bayou, the nature reserve. And um, Mark Kramer is going to tell us a lot about what's going on in that part of the world and how really incredible it is. And we don't know anything about it. It's a good part, so. Anyway, um, it is my pleasure to introduce um, John Stipp, who is worked in the offshore industry for many, many years, and he's going to tell us about the ups and downs of jackups. Um, and so we're not going to make any jokes about that. I'm going to let him take over and tell you exactly what it's all about. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Okay. Um, good evening. I'm going to talk about uh, the ups and downs of jackups. This is supposed to be an industry lecture, but um, it's actually going to be largely the history of jackups because uh, that's the side of it that I know best. And um, I thought I'd start on a good, upbeat note with a photograph of the stack rigs in Sabine Pass in 1986, and a nice sort of metaphorical downturn in the industry. Here we have, um, it's about 30 rigs stacked in Sabine Pass at the time, and um, I suppose that the, the upside of that is that we overcame that one, so maybe we'll overcome this one. Um, I didn't really know what the audience was going to be like tonight. Yeah. This doesn't seem to be working. I'm not advancing. Lauren. Lauren. Emma. Or Emma. <laughs> I can run it from the things, but I'll be walking in front of the screen all the time. Okay, They're mobile, they're definitely mobile. Um, the expression mobile is used frequently in the industry. I suppose the important thing about jackups is that they move around. They're capable of being moved from location to location to fulfill their purpose. And I'll just briefly go through that, how they do that in the next slide. Um, they're pretty much self-contained units. They have, they're like a small town. They have 100, 200 people on board. 
Um, this one would have had maybe 80 people on board. Um, people work on them for two weeks on, two weeks off, on a 12 hours <coughs> per day. So they work 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So they're out there for a long time. Um, they have all the facilities you'd expect them to have, accommodation, food, everything. If they're drilling, they probably have a, um, a boat come out to them pretty much on a daily basis because um, they need the drilling supplies. But for production, you know, if you had a jack up in production, then it would be have a lot less um, trips for a boat. Most of them now have three legs. And the reason that's important is because the next slide I show you, um, but most of them have three legs, but some of them had four, five, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, and a very large number of different legs. Okay, how do they work? And the reason I said they have three legs is because here you have a brilliant two-legged jacker. It's always consistently used. Everybody uses a two-legged jacker, which obviously would fall over, but they're nice, diagrammatically easy. So um, what you do is you start your rig uh, under tow, on its floating on its own buoyancy with the legs fully elevated, and you have a tug out at the front, not shown. Um, tug horsepower, well, you may need 100, 200 tons of bullet pull, something like that in the tug. And you tow it from location, and you get to your next location. Once you get to the next location, you lower the legs down onto the seabed, and start pushing them in. You then jack up to about a five foot air gap. You want to be about, about five foot above the sea, and that starts to push the legs into the seabed. Then the next stage is to pump water ballast on board. It's to preload the rig. And the purpose of preloading the rig is to really push the legs into the seabed. <coughs> I'll explain some of that a bit later. But um, So once you've preloaded the rig, and the amount of preload is quite a lot. I mean, you might double the weight of the hull, something like that, in, during preloading. Um, so it's a lot of water you're pumping on board. Um, <clears throat> once you've finished that process, once you've stopped penetrating, the legs have stopped penetrating the seabed, you then dump the preload. The reason I've got an exclamation mark at the end of this is because I've never come across this as being a problem on a jacker, but <coughs> some lift boats have said, oh, we've preloaded, and they've jacked up without actually dumping the preload. Um, then when they pick up a load, they tend to fall over, and that has happened. So dump the preload, jack up to the full air gap, and the purpose of the full air gap is to get you above the waves so that you don't get um, hit by any waves when, if a storm comes along. And then you would, if you were a drilling rig, you'd drill, skip the drilling package aft and start drilling operations. Very simple. I just want to give you a brief overview for those of you who don't know what a jack up is, sort of very quickly how they work. Now the next thing is, there we go, sorry. What's the first jack up? And a lot of people quote this, this Lewis patent submarine drilling machine as the first patent. It was in 1869. It was never built. Um, it's not really terribly practical. Here you've got the crew cranking the thing up by hand. Um, the, the, I suppose the only thing that's interesting about this is that Lewis got involved in a patent dispute with some people who were trying to remove Hellgate Rock in New York. And in fact, that's why this structure was designed, was for the removal of Hellgate Rock in New York. And um, someone used, tried to use something slightly different. It never did work. I mean, it, this was never built. The, I'm not sure what the outcome of the patent dispute was, but basically it didn't go anywhere. And they ended up blowing up Hellgate Rock by mining in from, from the shore, actually. It was, I believe it was the largest explosion in American history. So to call that the first jack-up is, in my personal, humble, totally unbiased opinion, as many of you know here, I don't have strong opinions, um, <laughs> is like calling this the first one of these is just absolutely not, it's not even in the starting blocks, in my personal opinion. So if that's not the first jack up, what is the first jack up? And I think this is the real story of the first jack up. 
And in the words of Buller Lytton in, his, uh, in his, the start of his book, Clifford, um, Paul Clifford, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and on 7.15, on the 28th of December, 1879, with a huge gale blowing up the Firth of Tay, and a train going north across the Firth of Tay from um, Perth north, probably exceeding the correct speed limit, um, the bridge collapsed while the train was right in the middle. And all 75 passenger and crew on board were killed. I mean, the problem, one of the biggest problems of the bridge is it just was not designed for the correct wind load. Completely ill-equipped for the correct wind load. But anyway, um, just as a very short aside, I think that this quote, in true Scottish fashion, from the um, Perth Courier the next day, is of the ill-fated passengers so suddenly summoned away from time, ten were un we understand were from Perth, and of these, eight were supplied with return tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, in true Scottish style, they were worried about the tickets. <laughs> Anyway, so here you've got this bridge, it's fallen down, and they really did need a new one. It was, it was a, a, quite a, a loss, and uh, so they need a new one, and that's when we come to the first, what I call Jack Up. Um, there were four of them built, so you could almost say it was mass produced. Um, it was built in 1884. <clears throat> you can see that the legs, it's got legs with almost something that looks like a spud can. The base of the legs of a jack-up have things called spud cans, which I'll show you a bit later, but almost looks like a, a, a spud can. Has a proper jacking system, um, and it was used to install the foundations for the new bridge. It was, I mean, it really was, um, it had its own power supply, it had facilities, although probably not particularly good facilities for the, for the crew, but it had, had the necessaries. And here are some drawings of the rig. The way it worked is it would move to location, you see it here, it would jack up, and it would install these caissons, which were the foundation for the new bridge. It would install steel caisson, then they'd evacuate that, then they'd in, in build a brick caisson inside it. And um, here's a picture of the jacking system, it's a nice hydraulic jacking system. When they wanted to move the rig, they would um, prepare for the rig move, and then they'd wait for the tide to come in, and that would float them over the caissons they'd installed, go off, move to the next location, <coughs> and install the next one. So, to me, this really is the first jack-up. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Richard Stoner, who someone I've worked with for many years, who uh, first introduced me to this structure. <coughs> okay. Oh. Early in the 20th century, there were a few other rigs floating around. I don't know much of what happened in this period. These are the um, this two photographs of Welland Ship Canal drill boat um, from 1914. I think there were sundry other vessels like this that were used at around that time. I haven't found much on them, but. There obviously were some other things, but these were all really stepping stones because they were all inshore things. It wasn't until this rig, the offshore rig 51, that you could say there was the, it was the first mobile offshore drilling jack-up. There had been other jack-ups before then, but they hadn't really been, um, they hadn't been drilling or, I mean, some were used I believe some were used in, in the Mulberry project, actually, or variations of them. And um, they've been used for construction, but this was the first one that was actually a drilling jack. Um, went into service in 1954, it had a long jacking system. It has 12 legs. Why did it have so many legs? And in order to really understand why it had so many legs, you've got to understand the jacking system. And this now, my poor son decided he wasn't going to come tonight. <laughs> so, <clears throat> unfortunately, that gives me carte blanche to uh, be cruel, but I don't think I'll, tr I'll try that. 
This is a photograph of my son <coughs> imitating a jacking system. And it has all the requisite parts. Well, you've got the leg, this is the pole. You've got the upper leg clamps, which are, is basically a strop. You've got the lower leg clamps, which are the, the things on his feet. And you've got the jacking motors, which are his legs. So basically, that is how the DeLong jacking system worked. You would move the upper clamp up, you tie it off, so you could support yourself on that. You move your feet up, dunk, dunk, then you'd straighten your legs. Then the next, you'd move the clamp up. Very simple, very simple process. And um, so all you need to do to convert the jacking system into a jack up is you Notice my brilliant drafting style here. You build a cage around it, the jacking system, and you tie it into the hull of the rig, and there you have a, a jacking system. But you can see there's a problem here. That this upper leg clamp, it's a piece of rubber that's inflated against a leg. You can't put an awful lot of load on that, or you start either ripping up the rubber, or it starts to slide. And the legs are only six foot in diameter, Actually, there were two types of leg. There were six foot and six foot one, depending on whether they were military or non-military. <laughs> um, and um, so it's, um, you need an awful lot of legs in order to lift the, the weight. That was the big problem, was lifting the weight. I, when I first came across this, I thought the legs were for structural purposes, to you know, make the rig stronger. No, it was to get the weight up. Um, here it is, and this is a slightly odd photograph, but the, the importance of this photograph is that it shows this jacking system next to this jacking system to make sure that they are the same. So here you've got the upper clamps, you've got the lower clamps, here is my beautifully drawn cage that fits around, here, the green part is the jacking system itself, the cage is tied to the rig and is the, uh, the case that surrounds it, the holds it in, in place. And you can see that actually the jacking system is up at the top so that the, the hull, which is supported through these rusty bits, is actually hanging off the leg. Um, and so there it is, and it's basically exactly the same as, as that there. Um, the reason the rig's at an angle is because I had a punch through, and I might get into that later. But, um, it just, it was a very, very simple jacking system. Okay, this is another type of early rig. This is the Bethlehem Mr. Gus. It was the first Bethlehem rig built. Um, it was delivered in 1954. Uh, it was built in, uh, in Beaumont. What's particularly interesting about this rig is that it doesn't have a buoyant upper hull. It wasn't actually towed on its upper hull. If you remember the first slide where I showed moving a jack up, it's supported on its, its hull, it's floating on its hull. This one didn't. Um, and it was, um, it, it was a distinctly odd design. So here you have it under tow, and you've got a mat down here, you've got this bracing in between the legs, and then you've got the upper hull um, being towed by the barge. So what it would do is when it got to location, <coughs> It would lower four of the legs down through the mat while it was afloat, and those would go down to the seabed. They would give the rig the stability it needed. They would then ballast the mat, or very carefully ballast the mat, and jack it down to the seabed. Once it was on the seabed, you then had the, the, uh, the stability to actually jack the hull up to the required air gap. It, strikes me as being an unbelievably complicated system, and I never did quite work out why it was so complicated, but um, it was reasonably successful for a time, but in 1957, when it was coming off location, it, uh, it started to tilt, and they tried to correct it, and basically, they never really recovered. So, it capsized. That brings us to what I consider the first modern jacker, which is, um, R.G. Letourneau's hull number one, the Scorpion. It was built in uh, 1955, and it was built for Zapata. Um, in fact, George H.W. Bush was the, was the contractor on it. 
What's interesting about it was that Zapata took almost no risk in buying this rig. I think the price was $3 million. And it was sale or return. So if you didn't like it, R.G. Letourneau, who was uh, had a very high opinion of himself. I think he deserved it, but he had a very high opinion of himself. So, OK, if you don't want it, I'll take it back. I'll find someone else who does want it. And um, actually, the, the rig was incredibly successful. Um, what makes this, though, a modern jacker is it's got three legs, not large numbers of legs. Each leg has got three cords, and it's got interbracing between the legs. I admit it is a bizarre bracing pattern, and they never use this again, but um, it has it. And at the base of the legs, you've got these spud cans, which are what interact with the, with the seabed. But the reason that this was a workable rig, and the reason that this was, you could, you could get away with limited number of legs, is because of the jacking system. He had the Laterno electric motors, and basically, they could jack whatever you wanted to jack. They had the capacity to really lift up a rig. <coughs> And so they could, it could cut down on the number of legs, which made the whole thing more sturdy, it made it simpler, um, just improved everything about it. And, and that's really why this is, to me, the first modern jack up. Um, after that, he built the Vinegaroon for Zabata, you know, which was delivered in 1957 give you an idea, this was built in 57, it was retired in 1983. I saw it being scrapped in Brownsville, and um, I was really sorry to see it scrapped. It seems such a shame that the Turno Hull number two gets scrapped, and you know, things like that happen, but it had basically the same electric, um, electric jacking system. The bracing pattern's become more logical, it's still not quite there yet, but it's getting there. Look where the heli deck is though. So in order to get access to this thing, you had to land on the top of the heli deck and go down a walkway inside that bow leg. And that was the, that was the way that jack-ups had their heli legs located for quite a long time, on top of the legs. So it was, um, it was quite a process to get down there. Um, I just throw this in for good measure. There was another uh, Letourneau hull, hull number nine, the Scarabeo, delivered in 1959. What's interesting about this, though, is it was converted to the Santa Rita, which was a missile tracking station off um, East Africa, um, off Kenya, <coughs> part of the Broglio, I don't know how you pronounce that, still, my Italian's not up to it, the Broglio uh, Space Center, um, and the, it was supported by the uh, San Marcos, which was another old offshore jack-up um, that was used for missile launches. And it, um, it operated there. I think it stopped it operating somewhere in the, the late 90s, but I'm not certain. Now, apparently, it's still, it's still operating. Well, I know that they are still thinking about renewing it, but I, I had mixed messages on whether it was operating or not. But it's... Uh, it's quite interesting that it's uh, the uses of these things. The other big builder at the time was Bethlehem Steel. They had the Mr. Gus one, which I showed you earlier, but their, their first sort of modern jack up was the Mr. Gus two, which was delivered <coughs> in 1957. It was a mat supported rig, it had four legs. Um, the reason that Bethlehem could get away with a smaller number of legs on this type of rig rather than the earlier one using the DeLong jacking system is that Bethlehem used a pinhole system. They cut pinholes in these legs. The legs of this are probably 12 foot in diameter or possibly 15 foot in diameter as opposed to the 6 foot of the, uh, the DeLong jacking system. And the pinholes, well the pins that they use for jacking are big. They're that sort of size. Solid steel pins. I, I, you know, I know roughly the size of them because I can climb through a pinhole and I've done it. Although, I'm not quite sure I can do it now. But, uh, it's, um, I have done it. 
and and because they you know they just had much bigger equipment and you know you can build the, the hydraulic jacks big enough it was the gripper system that they didn't have before now with this they had um, a jacking system that worked really quite successfully and the the mystic us 2 was only scrapped a few years ago it uh, survived a long time um, it did have some problems and i'll talk a bit about those in a minute but that was the, the other major design in 1965 abs organized a special committee to develop the um, mode rules. And um, I think what's interesting is, I think, oops, I think this person down here, F. Tim Pease, is sitting in front row of the audience today. I don't, uh, nobody else on that list is here, but <coughs> what's important about this though, and I think this really is important, the letter says it would be our purpose to make these rules sound and practical without making them restricted for future development. People wanted rules to help them organize what they needed to do. They were used, what they were doing at the, before that was sort of shoehorning the rig designs into other class rules, things like the, um, the steel vessel rules or barge rules or whatever it was. And the idea of actually developing some rules specifically for mobile offshore drilling units was, I think, reasonably well accepted. I, I will take comment if that's not true, Tim. <laughs> but um, anyway, so they were written by experts um, from the industry and were published in uh, 1968. Um, and I think, I think it was quite an achievement, that. I think it was quite an important step. Okay, because there were so many different varieties of numbers of lakes to these things, Captain Noble, who was the um, was one of, I suppose, the founder of uh, Noble Denton, used to say that you could drink to the one-legged rig, the two-legged rig. The two-legged rig, by the way, was not a jacker. That was a concrete platform. But I always heard that they could get up to about the 13th-legged rig. Now, what I'm not sure about is whether there is a 13th leg, 13 leg rig or whether by the time you've had 12 drinks getting there you couldn't even think about a 12 or 13 leg rig so I'm not, I'm not quite certain about that but there were, certainly were some odd ones I mean this, the Ile de France has five legs it's interesting this concept of having more legs because more legs means it's stronger but more legs also means you're attracting more load so you've got a trade off and People didn't necessarily know which was the way to go um, at the time. Anyway. Now, this is a slightly odd collection of photographs here, but one of the things you want to do with the jack-up is to do work over. You want to be able to drill over a platform in the relatively shallow water. People put in fixed platforms, they drill the wells, they put the platforms in, but then as the wells get old, they need to be repaired, or they might want to drill new wells. So here's a platform, here's a Bethlehem rig. But the problem is that, and this, that's why this photograph on the right is actually useful, because it shows there is the slot in the hull of the jack-up, and here is a slot in the mat. Um, and so what you have to do in order to fit this rig um, well that one you're not going to fit around anything but that's beside the point but in order to fit the equivalent of that rig around this, this jacket here, this platform you have to bring it up pretty bloody carefully and fit that, that jacket into the slot in this rig now people worked it, it, it could be done but it was a tricky manoeuvre and it meant that you know, if you did things incorrectly, you could actually quite easily damage the, uh, either the jacket or the jacket. So, what the, what the people then devised is really the next um, fairly major development is the cantilever. And here you have a Laterno 116 class rig with the C at the end is for cantilever. And it's showing that you can basically, you bring the rig up to against the platform, 
you can jack it up. You don't have to fit it around the platform at all. You just bring it up and then you can skid the cantilever out over the platform. Um, this was, in fact, it's interesting, this is probably the most successful class of rig ever built, the Latona 116C. Um, I don't know when they started building them, probably in the early 70s, or around some time in the 70s. 1974. 74, okay. And they're still build, basically building them. I mean, they're modified, they're not quite the same, but they are still doing them. And uh, it was really, it was quite a successful design. Um, this one could, could cantilever out, could drill 40 feet aft of the transom, and they could skip 15 feet each side. So it gave you the opportunity to, you know, really drill <coughs> some, some wells from a, from a platform, over a platform. You still had to worry about what was happening to the feet down at the bottom. They weren't interacting with the, uh, um, the jacket legs, but um, that was less of a problem for them than it was for the camp. Bethlehem also developed cantilever rigs, but they still had this problem of having to fit here the jacket, the, the mat of the jack up rig around the jacket. Um, so that really, I think, with the, 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 the mat rigs had their place, but they started to really fall and fail in the, uh, in the 80s. By the end of the 80s, really, people weren't building them anymore. Um, but there were a lot of them built. There were a huge number of uh, Bethlehem Mat Rigs. By the way, I don't want to give the impression that there are only two companies doing this, Bethlehem and Laterno. Um, the offshore company was designing their own rigs. Since then, you've had Frieden Goldman, Keppel's got their designs, you've got um, marine structural consultants. There are plenty of people who design rigs. It's just that really, Bethlehem and Laterno were the two that probably the most, the two most famous ones at the, at the start of the process. Having designed your rig and built your rig, you now want to get it to where it wants to drill. Well, if that's built in the Gulf of Mexico and drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, that's easy. But if you want to take it across the Atlantic to uh, somewhere else, you've got to tow it there. And I knew this photograph. Oh, by the way, this is Captain Noble who was involved in this first tow. This is the AMDP-1 tow across the Atlantic in 1958. What I hadn't realized until I was putting this slide together was that the depth of the hull on this rig is only 10 feet and it has a five foot draft. That means it's got five foot of freeboard being towed across the Atlantic. That's not a lot of freeboard. By comparison, a 116 has a 26 foot deep hull and a 16 foot draft. So it's got 10 foot of freeboard. And being on one of those when it's rough, you see green water on the deck. So this, it was quite, quite a thing. What's interesting though, is that the criteria that Captain Noble set up in the, for the tow of this, pretty much remains intact today. I mean, it's, um, it's pretty much what, the, what was set up back in those days. These are some photographs of the tow. Um, the one thing I would like to bring out is here, are these late stays. It was thought that if you stay the legs, you'll actually help reduce the loads in the leg. Brilliant idea in one direction. Really bad idea in the other direction. So if your leg is trying to fall overboard, great, it gets stayed and it gets held back. But when the rig rolls in the other direction, not only do you have the rig rolling it back and pulling it backward, you've also got the stay pulling it backwards, plus a good bit of dynamics thrown in for good measure. So I think that the stays, I don't know how long they lasted being used, but um, they, they lasted longer than they should have done, I think. <laughs> um, okay, come on. Okay. Um, Mr. Davis, I'm sorry, I've plagiarized your photographs. <laughs> Sometimes they use sail assist for. Now, this was, it was still being towed. This is not sailing by its own power, but it was, it was being towed, and uh, this is the Charles Rowan in 1981. Um, a friend of mine at Noble Denton, uh, Mike Hoyle, who had just graduated from Cambridge University and joined Noble Denton, 
um, and the person who hired him knew that he happened to be a sailor. And so his first job was, here, Mike, is this going to work? <laughs> and um, Mike did some calculations and said, I think his conclusion was, yes, but it's not going to be very economic. Um, and Jim, you may want to comment on this, I don't know, but I think the intent was that it would cut down on the fuel consumption from the tugs. No, you know, it wasn't it? Was, it was to say, we, we put it up to stabilize the tow. Oh, it was to stabilize it. This was to stabilize the tow behind the Paul were noticed it was not tracking straight behind the vessel. Ah. And we could roll or read the sails. Okay, so it was it was um, for directional stability behind the tow. With a, with a 20 knot following wind, you get 0.3 knots increase in speed. Yeah. Jim, by the way, was, this was his project, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Anyway, um, and I just throw this in for good measure because this is my first rig move. Um, this, <coughs> this, by the way, is me. And if you doubt it, and you can get your magnifying glass out and inspect it. This was Christmas 1976, and they said, oh, John, do you want to do a, a, uh, a training trip? And I said, oh, golly, good idea. So I was sent out to the Mask Explorer. It was a short move. It was supposed to be, you know, start just a couple of days before Christmas, finish a couple of days after Christmas. It was a short move. All we needed was a good weather window. So the weather forecasters in London rang us up and said, oh, got a weather window opening up. So we jacked down into the water, pulled the legs, started to get underway, and the people in uh, London said, called up and said, by the way, um, I'd suggest you delay this move because the weather window isn't existing. You're, you're, you're going to have some bad weather in a minute. And we certainly did. So um, we, uh, we ended up being evacuated from the rig. What's interesting though is that in 1976, you didn't wear immersion suits when you were evacuated. <laughs> if we'd gone down in that water, um, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I mean, it's. I, I didn't realize that at the time. <laughs> but um, this, this photograph was made the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, so it was obviously a very dull Christmas. Okay. Toes weren't always very successful. This is the toe of the Dan Prince across the Gulf of Alaska. It set out in 1980. It, um, it was a man tow. You know, who would tow a rig across the Gulf of Alaska in winter, in December? It's just not one of the brightest things to do. Now, fortunately, they, uh, the Coast Guard managed to evacuate the crew. But then, you, what, you, what happens is that 32 years later, someone decides to do exactly the same thing. In December, Gulf of Alaska, oh dear, what happened? Okay, it didn't sink this time. It just broke the tow bars and lines of run aground. You know, you have to learn from history occasionally. Um, so what's the answer? I, I actually only came across this uh, yesterday while I was looking for the slides put in here. There's a precedent from the 17th and 18th century for ships of the line in uh, Amsterdam that they couldn't get into Amsterdam Harbor. So what they put them on is a sort of a floating towing dry dock and then they would tow them into Amsterdam. And so someone thought, well, that's a good idea. Why don't we do that with jack-up rigs? And so you have OTC, offshore towing contractors, did the first dry tow in uh, 1973. It was the Gatto Selvatico from Ravenna um, in Italy in the Adriatic to Dar es Salaam uh, in East Africa. So it's nearly 10,000 miles around the Cape of Good Hope. It's quite, a, quite an impressive curve. What I've done here on the left is to show, well, this actually is, I think, the C.E. Thornton. The, the OTC brochures I have are inconsistent, but I'm pretty sure that's the C.E. Thornton, not the Gado Salvatico. But what you do is you take the barge and you put the stern on the seabed. Now, this, this indicates that you don't do that, but you put the stern on the seabed, you float the rig over it, when you get contact between the rig and the barge, you can now get stability. You can't take this thing down horizontally because there's no buoyancy at the stern. So you have to put it on the seabed. But once you get the rig onto it and you pick up stability from that, you can deballast this underneath, maintaining contact, 
and it brings it up and you load the jack up onto the barge. And it's, um, it was quite a successful process. I mean, it worked. Um, it's much faster. A jack up towed on its own hull will go about four knots downhill with the wind behind it. They, they just don't like being towed. These ones, they're making this, I mean, OTC claimed an average of eight knots for this, much faster. The, the importance of speed, though, is that speed means you're exposed for less time. And less exposure is less chance of bad weather, which is important. But then you get to the limits of this. Here's, th this is a bit of a complicated photograph, but this here, down here, is an ocean servant barge. And what this is the stern of the barge. And what they did is they put sponsons at the stern of the barge so that, in fact, they could lower the thing horizontally. Now they didn't have to put the stern of the barge on the seabed. They could lower it horizontally. You could float the rig over it and de-ballast it, pick it up. Works very well. But if you look at this, this particular rig had a massive spud can below the hull. And so, it, and this is actually Colin Davy demonstrating his immense strength trying to lift it into place. <laughs> um, but so, what they ended up having to do for this rig, because it, they couldn't load it, this couldn't go down deep enough to load this directly on it. They jacked the rig up. They brought a barge underneath the rig, jacked the bar, the rig down onto the barge, so it was floating. Then floated the barge and the rig over the other barge. Then secured the whole lot and set sail. Um, it's a complicated process. So really, this is where you go next. These are the, the semi-submersible self-propelled ships. You don't have a tow wire to break. I mean, the, the problem with any tow is the tow wire. If you're close to shore and your tow wire breaks, you're likely to have your cargo run aground. If you're at sea, and you have your tow line break, you probably turn beam onto the seas and you start rolling really, really badly, which isn't good for the, for the cargo. To give you some perspective, this rig's got 410 foot of leg, and it's probably a little longer than the, the ship. So it's um, a relatively small ship. Um, this, was, this is the turn class, uh, sorry, it's a swan class, it's the divvy turn. They've been, since been bought by Dockwise and their, you know, the Dockwise ships, but the, the point about them is that they're much better shaped. They're a real ship-shaped vessel. They can maneuver, they can move, they can avoid bad weather, they can do the things that a ship can do, which a barge tow really couldn't do by itself. So that's the, the uh, start of these, and since then they've just got bigger and bigger. This is the um, a, uh, Super Servant, um, Weissmuller Super Servant with a Bethlehem rig on it, um, after the, which is 140 meters long. The next step was the Mighty Servants, which this one was extended to 190 meters, the Mighty Servant 1. It was actually shorter than that. And fairly recently, you've now got the Vanguard, um, the Dockwise Vanguard, which really is it's nearly twice as long as this. It's uh, well, 275 and this is 140, so it's nearly twice as long. And this is a, it's, it didn't actually transport the, the uh, Costa Concordia, but it was a plan, it had been part of the original salvage plan that it would transport it. So, you know, it gives you an idea of the size of this vessel by comparison to a pretty large cruise ship. Um, so, anyway, okay. I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an introduction to the forces on a jackup. This helps explain why you have to preload them. So here you've got your nice two-legged jackup, always the two-legged jackup, and you've got wind force here, and you've got the wave and current force here, and my beautifully drawn sea state, and you will notice that the hull is above the top of the waves. This is exactly as you want it. Because if the hull is not above the top of the waves, the wave load increases enormously and things start to go bad very quickly. But if you can imagine this, you've got this wind force here, wave and current force. What that ends up producing is a large overturning moment on the structure. 
So this overturning moment is resisted mainly by foundation reactions. And people are going to say I've drawn the arrows the wrong way. But um, what happens is under this overturning moment, the load increases in this leeward leg and decreases in the windward leg. Now, if you jacked up on location and you hadn't preloaded, when the storm came along and you saw this increase in leg, in leg load, the rig would take on additional penetration and potentially lead to a uh, collapse. So that's why you preload the rig. And it really is, it really is a very, very important step. And indeed, a lot of the early rigs, the limitation on many of the early rigs was their preload capacity. They just didn't have enough preload capacity for the storms. And you can, it can be argued that probably the most common cause of jack-up failure in storms is due to foundation failure. Um, so I thought I'd just quickly go through the concept of a punch through. If you look at this side over here, I, I, doesn't matter that you can't read it. This, what's important is it's nice soils. This is nice stuff. So you have depth below the seabed down here and bearing capacity along here. So when you first put your jack up onto location, if you've got this nice soils, your spud can, your leg goes down and it penetrates to here. And then you put a bit more load on it and with preload and it comes down to here. But even if this load here is exceeded in a storm, all that's going to happen is it's going to go down a little more. It's not going to go down very much more. So you've got a good foundation. That's a nice foundation. This side over here is a potential punch through location. There are, there are masses of causes or potential causes for punch throughs. This is probably the most obvious um, example, which is why I use it. What you've got is you've got a soft layer up here in the soils. You've then got a hard layer, and you've got another soft layer. Now, if the soft layer is very thin, what happens is the, the rig comes on, and it just jacks up, and it, the leg goes straight away through the soft layer. If the soft layer is quite thick, the rig comes on, it puts its foot down, the bearing capacity point and the load it's got comes down to this penetration. It then starts to take on preload. Well, at some point it reaches this point here. Now, there, you can see what's happening is the capacity, the strength of the soils, is plummeting backwards. So if you go from there to there, beyond it, your leg, your leg goes from here down to there, very suddenly. It's not nice. It's, it's a not a nice thing to happen. As I say, there are lots of other causes for punch through, but that's probably the, the most classic example of a punch through. And the results can be quite nasty. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Rio Colorado one off um, Tierra del Fuego in San Sebastian Bay. What's remarkable about this rig is that it, the, the legs were incredibly sturdy. I wouldn't say it was an efficiently designed rig, <coughs> but the legs were strong <coughs> and it suffered almost no damage, but had a very severe punch through. Um, here's a lift boat. I've mentioned lift boats earlier. It's, um, uh, it's a lift boat which had a punch through in the Gulf of Mexico. I think it later capsized. And here's one, the Paranegro 6 in 2013 off the Congo River. It punched through and uh, basically slowly collapsed afterwards. It punched through is probably the largest <coughs> operational loss of rigs now is due to punch through. And it's very, very important you get good soils data before you put a rig on location. It's really important. Of course, nobody, uh, people that still don't do it necessarily, but it is really important. Um, okay. Um, they do occasionally collapse, these rigs. Here's a Bethlehem rig that had a, a blowout. Um, this, as you might realize, is not a jack-up, but it found a jack-up. 
It was sailing up the channel and it came across a jackup that had collapsed during a hurricane. And it didn't know it was there. Neither did anybody else. They'd been looking for it for, for months. In fact, they'd only just given up looking for it. Um, so it, you can see it did a fair amount of damage to the, the hull of that. Um, this was the Blown Wild Labrador 1. It was quite happily sitting in the middle of the North Sea when the ship called the Irving Forest came and uh, decided that, um, well, they didn't really need anybody in the wheelhouse. I mean, why do you need someone in the wheelhouse? <laughs> and so it, it steamed right into the, uh, the jack up. Um, fortunately, I mean, really fortunately, it was a four chord leg. It's got four, you can't tell it very clearly, but it's got four chords and they only knocked out one of the chords and the rig survived and um, nobody was injured. But if that actually had gone through a bit further in, it could have been really quite disastrous. The reason I include this photograph is just to give you some idea of scale. This is a rig that collapsed in Hurricane Allen in 1981. I was involved in the salvage of it. This rack is five inches thick. Um, you can see, I mean, Bill Evans wasn't a particularly tall man, but even then, that's a hell of a lot of bending of that leg. I mean, that's quite a lot of ductility in the material, which is, I think, quite impressive. I mean, it took, it, it took a lot to break that leg. And um, I can assure you the welds on that leg were not very good. But um, I've got some photographs elsewhere of them. But, you know, it, it's very impressive that this, this leg really did manage to bend that much. Um, anyway, I, I quite like that. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, getting close to the end. I just put this in because I think this is, is quite interesting. Jackups have actually had a place in people's hearts in certain areas of the world. Um, you'll find them on quite a lot of currency around the world. I think this is a Malay um, note. I had to buy this off good Dr. Sharples. <laughs> I, had to pay, I had to look up the exchange rate and pay him the exchange rate to get that note. <laughs> um, but this is a one rupee note, which I can assure you I could easily afford. But what's interesting is that it's got this picture of this rig on it, the Saga Samra. And this is a comparable picture of a similar rig, the Offshore Mercury, which is one from uh, um, Tim Pease's company. Um, now, the reason that the Indians were so pleased with this rig is they were looking for oil in the 70s, and they couldn't find it. People had been looking offshore India. Nobody was finding any oil. They bought this rig. They took it out, and the first well it drilled, it hit, and it had produced oil. So it became almost a folk hero in the Indian culture. <laughs> Hence, it was put onto their one rupee note and a one rupee coin and all these things. <laughs> so, very nice. That was in about 76. In 96, I went out to do some work on the, um, the Saga Samrat and to advise on some repairs that they wanted made. And one of the things they asked me is, can they cut off these, what are called, king posts? Now, if you look at this profile of this rig, you can't see them too well on the, on the note. If you look at the profile of this rig, they're very characteristic. I mean, they, they stand out as, you know, these are part of the rig. And anyway, I looked at these king posts. What they're used for is for removing top sections of lake for towage. The Saga Samrak was never going to go in. It wasn't going to go on any long towage. So I said, of course you can remove them. I mean, they're rusty. If you try to, if you try to use them, they'll probably break and kill someone. They're completely rusted in place. And I also knew that the rig, whenever it went under tow, or actually it went self-propelled, but, but, but slightly, whenever it went into the water, you'd never see the load line because it was so overweight. So, you know, taking the king post off was a some way of reducing the weight. I put this in my report, and it was about six months later, I thought, you know, I was talking to someone about the job, and I said, why the hell are they worried about taking the king posts off? And suddenly it occurred to me, this is an iconic rig. You can't change its profile. They just needed an external consultant to say, 
take the damn things off. <laughs> but nobody was prepared to do it in India. So, anyway. And finally, these aren't really jackups, but they are a couple of my favorite rigs. Really are. This one on the left is, is absolutely my favorite rig. I think this is the Transocean 3. There were two of them built. There was the Transocean 3, the Transworld 61. They are semi-submersibles. They're not jackups. But the legs have jacks on them, so you can jack them down. And so what you do is you tow the rig in this configuration here to location, and then you ballast these footings here down in deep water, not, not in shallow water. This isn't to sit on the seabed or anything. You, you ballast these down until the tops here are at the top of the upper guy. And then you deballast everything so that the hull, so that the whole thing sits on the columns. And it floats on the columns, and you have a mooring system, and it acts as a semi submersible. Um, this, I was so impressed with this that one of my cardboard cutout Christmas card models was of the Transworld 61. And um, this is a, a photograph of the model that I made of it. Um, it's just a delightful design of rig. Transworld did a number of these, they did a lot of individual rigs. I mean, they, <coughs> I think they were great imagination. None of them really worked very well, but gorgeous imagination. <laughs> um, the, the Transocean 3, um, Malcolm tells me, Malcolm Sharples, who was my boss for many years, he tells me that they had a permanent welding crew on board because the, these things were continually trying to break off. So in the storm, they'd go out and <laughs> weld them up again. And that's in fact actually what did happen to the Transocean 3. It finally broke off and, uh, and capsized and sank. Although the Transworld 61 was uh, eventually scuttled off uh, Brazil, having worked down there for a time. This one is the Transworld 6, 60, which is a jack-up submersible. So this one, you put this lot down on the seabed, and then you jack up. And the idea is to probably reduce the wave loads on the, on the thing. But again, it's sort of taking the jack up and melding it with something else and, uh, and creating a, a different type of structure. And then there are modern jack ups. But they're another story, and I'm not going to talk about those. So thank you very much. Oh, wow. Any questions except from the peanut gallery? I can see them sitting in the back. <laughs> You obviously had a lot to do with rigs. In what particular specific capacity were you involved with jackups? Um, mainly analyzing them for use on location and for towage, um, which is interesting because the purpose of the jackup is to <coughs> drill a hole in the ground. And it's very easy for me to forget its purpose is to drill a hole in the ground because all I did was look at them for towage and for operations. But yes, it was the structural strength. Yep. What was the, if we can imagine an average life of one of these rigs, what would it be and in how many different locations might they have uh, been floated to and worked out? Um, the, the sort of, the, the, the simple answer is 20 years for the life, but actually oh, yeah. that's, that's not true because the Mr. Gus II, which was built in 57, was retired probably 50 years later. Um, the Vinegaroon, it was, you know, 30 years. They've still got, there, there were rigs that were new when I came to Houston 35 years ago that are still operating. So um, some of them are being scrapped, but it's remarkable. You can replace a lot of steel in these things. Um, <coughs> Someone used to tell me that the biggest problem with them is they become technically obsolete. You can't get parts for the drilling system, you can't get parts for the cranes, you can't get parts for any of the electronics, and, and really the, the, the systems get out of date. How many different locations oh, location. might one have? Um, 
it's, I mean, some of them would be on location for maybe a few months at a time, a move um, every few months. But, you know, some rigs would be moving. There was one that I was on down in Tierra del Fuego. It was doing work over, over two platforms. It was moving at least every month. Um, so, and it was down there for, I think, four years or something like that. So there's a, there's a lot of moves. Yeah. Yep, sir, back. Um, I, I missed the part about preloading. What is that again? Preloading is basically, you, when, you, when you jack the hull out of the water um, and you, press, you push the, seat, the legs into the seabed, you pump water onto the hull, and a lot of water. You sort of roughly double the weight of the hull to really press the legs into the, into the seabed. And um, of course, having pressed them into the seabed, you can have problems pulling the legs out again. And that has, some rigs have been stuck on location. And probably the most famous of these was the George Ferris, which was in Cook Inlet. It couldn't get its legs out. There's a 30 foot tide in Cook Inlet. Couldn't get the legs out, the jacking system broke down. Then the tide came in. <laughs> and uh, they end up having to blow the legs off that one. That's why they put a jetty system on. Yes, but the jetting system, the problem with the jetting system is that you probably have, maybe have two jetting lines go down each leg. That's feeding 15 jets. Once the first jet is free from each of those jetting lines, then all the flow goes to that one jet. And the other ones remain clogged up. I mean, jetting the legs out is a it's still hotly debated as the way as which is the best way to do it. But yes, they do put jets on on the, uh, the legs, and they do help. John, I was wondering, is there a way to evaluate the integrity of the seabed to prevent punch through without putting the jack up on the core of the yeah. seabed to see the thickness of the? Can you do it with seismology? They mm -hmm. do. They. They do geophysical assessments, which gives you some idea of the seabed itself. They do do um, shallow seismic, and that helps. But they basically, you really need um, soil moorings. And you don't have to take those from a jack up. There are, there are um, survey boats that will go out and do it. Or um, one company, Rowan, they all, went, when they went to a location, they just pinned the rig. Um, very gently pin the legs, and then they'd skid minimum aft, and they'd drill down and just take a, a boring. Yeah. Um, oil companies are supposed to supply this data to the drilling contractor. It's still not always supplied though. Yeah. Yep. What future do you see for jackups? I think there's still quite a bright future for jerk ups. Um, it's, it, I don't know, I mean, I'm not, I, I haven't kept up that much with the, um, with the, the wells and the well technology, but, you know, I think that there's, um, there are still wells out there that you can, that to be drilled. There's still work over to be done. Um, there's still some very deep wells, I think, that need to be drilled in relatively shallow water, and some of those jack-ups will be used. There are still a lot of jack-ups out there, and they still have uh, contracts, and they're still being used. And at the moment, there's a downturn in the industry, but um, they haven't stopped building them. And you didn't mention they need to be out there now 400 feet in the North Sea. Very oh, yes, yes. I mean, they, they do things out there. Yes. They're, they're, they're certainly, um, the, I think that the limits must be, the, the current record must be around 500 foot water depth, something like that, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I mean, these rigs here were a maximum of 300 foot for any of them, but now certainly 500 foot. Yeah, we have a model in the energy room that's yes. rated at 500. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether that's still current. Yeah, the, the 500 feet rating tends to be with very little penetration and a very small air gap. But yes, it is. I mean, it's basically, it is rated for, for 500 feet. It's uh, they're, they're good for that. John, sorry, I'm not trying to take Leslie's time. She was called away for a family emergency. Uh, my name is Mel Rose. I've been involved with the museum for a number of years. And she's asked me to thank you, John, 
Um, and uh, we had a lecture here. Some of us were here before with the uh, Dockwise people that came in. And this, yeah. this dovetails very nicely with what we uh, what we saw of the, of the Dockwise yeah. presentation. Yeah. It's fascinating, fascinating industry. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Very small token of appreciation. <laughs> and we know a lot of preparation goes into it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.